Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and let Leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness. Explore ideation. Build community and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast. And this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm your host, Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be here with you and have our special guest. Dr. Michael Davis, who is an Associate Executive Director of Prevention at Guide. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on the show. I'm super excited to have you here, um, in, in light of, especially in light of what we're going to be discussing. But first, I'm going to tell our guest a little bit about you. So everyone, Michael Davis serves as Guide's Associate Executive Director of Prevention since August of 2018. In this role, Michael is responsible for oversight of all of Guide's prevention strategies, activities, and campaigns. So prior to working to Guide, Michael's career background was focused mainly on college students, serving in several roles in housing, financial aid, and the Dean of Students office at four different universities. In his last role at Iowa State University, he served as interim coordinator for prevention services during the university restructure. And Michael was, was reminded of his passion for working with prevention programs. In that role, with his work at Chi Phi Fraternity, Michael frequently presented on alcohol risk reduction, bystander intervention, consent and healthy relationships education, power-based violence prevention, and social justice issues. At Iowa State, Michael attended the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity, also known as NCOR, and was on the planning committee for the Iowa State Conference on Race and Ethnicity, also known as I-SCORE. Michael has volunteered and served on many different boards during his career, most recently serving as Chair of Alumni Relations for the University of West Georgia Alumni Association, Board of Directors, and the Accreditation Committee for the Chi Phi Fraternity. Previously, he served as a chair of the board of directors for the Assault Care Center Extending Shelter and Support, also known as ACCESS, in Ames, Iowa. Michael was also a trained volunteer advocate for ACCESS while he lived in Ames. Michael holds a PhD in education from Iowa State University, a master of science degree in professional counseling from Georgia State University, and a bachelor of science degree in early childhood education from the University of West Georgia. Michael is presented on the local, state, and national levels on leadership, education, prevention, and social justice issues. Michael, once again, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Thank you. That's a very long uh, bio. Thank you for introducing me. No, um, it's a worthy bio. We have to share all of this information. So today, what you and I specifically are going to be talking about is privilege. And as I said, I think this is a fantastic issue. I've been wanting to discuss it for the longest time. I think it's timely, I think it's necessary, and I'm really excited to just dive on deep. So I've told our audience a bit about your professional background, but tell us what made you enter into this line of work. Excellent. Well, I'll start off since this is a podcast and people can't see me. I always give a disclaimer in all of my work is I'm a white cisgendered male. So I want to put that out there to begin with because I believe I mainly with my work with Hi Fi in um, Iowa State. Um, I worked a lot with white people because um, I think we have a lot of room to grow and do work on making the world a better place, right? And it's on us. Um, and oftentimes white people don't engage in this. And I think it takes white people to challenge other white people, but also all of the privileges out there. It's more than just race. It's more than just gender. It's more than just sexual identity. Um, there's so many privileges out there. There's ability, socioeconomic privilege, a lot of privileges out there. 
but I come from a very love and liberation background in my social justice work. And really, I pay homage to the primarily women of color who were the founding, I say, goddesses of love and liberation of uh, work, um, but also some women of color in my life, um, Dr. Rachel Wagner at Clemson University, who took me to MCOR for the first time and showed me love and liberation work and some stuff like that. So paying homage to them too on the work. So why am I interested in this, this work? I just think through all of my, all of my professional career, right, you can just see where systems are in place that benefit people and hold people down. Right. And it just was never fair to me. Like when I was studying early child education, you went into the classroom and you could see from a early age mm-hmm. how um, someone's skin color or gender or gender expression or assumption of gender expression. Right. Because we assume even at young age, when you're hearing you're gay, you're um, all that stuff at a very young age, how that affects people, you know, and then. Uh, going into college students, working with college students, seeing them challenge their own identities and meeting people that are different than them and actually learning about people and changing their beliefs, I think, is a radical time in people's lives. And so I'm very passionate about working with youth and our college students while they're in that identity formation part and working with the people that influence what they do um, with that. And then with our newest grant that guide with uh, suicide prevention, you see all, all of this and the trauma and the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences um, that our um, children of color primarily, you know, um, are facing, right? And they're having more adverse childhood experiences than other or a lower class children that are having those ACEs experience. So I think it's important in this work and to reach everybody and to make our services fair and as equitable as possible for people um, to work towards that liberation. I think experiencing it in my own personal life makes me passionate about continuing doing the work and whatever job I do, you know, I work for, uh, when I worked at Chi Phi, it was a primarily white uh, straight male fraternity. But I was always presenting education and social justice there, too. Because I think people want, from my love and liberation background, people want to do better. I don't think most people wake up every day and say, I want to be racist today. I believe there are some out there, right? Uh, But I think the majority of people just don't know how to do better, right? And so it's it's my job to kind of help them. Tell me a bit more about your love and liberation um, background, because I want to hear more about that. I've never heard that before. So tell me a bit about that. So um, the best image, I can, if I can paint a picture of you of like um, the different graphics, I think a lot of people have seen the graphics with the three, um, assuming from the back male, where one guy standing up on the fence and he can see over the fence, he's a tall guy yeah. and they're watching a baseball game, you know, that image. I um, that and that. <laughs> yeah. And one, and one guy's kind of medium height. He's on his his square, his little box, and he can see over it. And then there's a the little guy that's, you know, small, and he's only got one square and he can't see over it. And they say, you know, this is, everyone has one square that's um, kind of, that's equality, right? And then they show, they take the tall guy away and give the little guy two squares. So they said, this is equity. So people, this tall guy was always going to see, the middle guy needed the one box and the little guy needed two boxes to see over the fence. Mm-hmm. Um, then the the version that I show a lot of times says, um, um, basically it says reality and it has like 18 tall guys and the little guys like in a hole, like, you know, and so he was never, no matter how many boxes. And liberation work says, why do we have the fence up? If we took down the fence, everyone could be as they are and be successful. Like we're putting up barriers in our success and in our in in our system and through social justice. Social justice to me, social justice work ultimately is saying we're trying to change the system so there's not a wall. There's not a barrier. Everyone can watch from where they're at, and that's okay. Like you know what I mean? That is okay. So um that's kind of the liberation. And I'm going, the, the, the goal of liberation is saying you can be who you are as you are and still be successful and not, and not encounter systems that will disadvantage you because of your being, you know, and I think the love background for me and the love background is, it, is that idea of everyone, the majority of people want to do better, right? They just don't know how 
you know, and so it's a very loving, when I talk about privilege, I say it's a dreaded P word, you know, that in social justice that a lot of people are like, uh, especially like a lot of white males have been kind of, they feel like they've been attacked with this word, right? You know, whether it's not, and it's like, it's, sorry, that word doesn't sit well with you, it, but it's facts, you know, I mean, it's reality um, for some of your identities, not all of them, not all of them, right? But some of your identities, um, it is facts. Um, but when we when we look at it, it, it's saying like, we probably all want to do better. And I'm going to come at it from a not attacking stance. I have, and, and this is a privilege too, um, I, and I'll own my privilege on that too, that I can come at it and say, I can have a conversation with you from a very loving stance um, to get you to understand why liberation. I believe people change for two reasons. I believe that people change because they're scale, scared or because they of love. And being scared gets old for people. So when they get scared and they're scared into that, eventually they're going to fight back and fight the system. And I, I think, um, sorry to make this political a little bit, but I think that's what you saw with Donald Trump, Trump's election, right? You know, people that came out said, bring back the good order. They're tired of being scared, right? You know, whereas when we come with love and say, let me connect with you in some way, they want to do better because they want to do better for someone they love. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Michael, you just dropped so many gems right now. And I'm just like, which one do I go at first? So <laughs> I'm gonna go at, at the um the image, the visual that you painted for us with the um the three boys, right? Or or who we perceive to be boys, right? Um I use that in a lot of my trainings for explaining the difference between fairness, right? For the difference between equality and equity, right? And um I, I'm an adjunct professor of political science, so I always get political science. Somewhere. But I always thought that um, to explain our systems to young people in particular, that's a great thing to use. But I also use it when I'm talking about cultural competence, right? Again, equality yeah. versus equity, because it's it's sometimes I think people conflate those two and, and they're so very different. But what blew my mind about what you said, because I was experiencing a little cognitive dissonance there, dissonance there, um, but what blew my mind was that I had never even considered the fence not being there. Right. I had never considered the barrier not being there because I myself, quite honestly, am so accustomed to them being mm -hmm. there, you know, and that mm -hmm. shapes, as, as we were talking about off air, that shapes my reality. Right. And so I have to navigate and I'm used to navigating those fences. But what ends up happening is that builds up um, this this sort of fatigue right? This emotional, mm -hmm. mental, financial fatigue as well. You're, and, and I'll go back to, um, I remember a long time ago in college, um, I put myself through college by working um, like many people did. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was working um, for an airline named Air France and it was fabulous and wonderful. And, and I loved everything about it. I got to use my language skills. It was fantastic. But I also knew there was an unstated rule, right? And I'm just using this company as an example, but I knew that people of color had to present themselves in a particular way. We had to look a certain way. And that was at the very highest standard. And I just thought to myself, well, shouldn't we all have the same standard? But we knew if we didn't, or even wearing our hair naturally, right? Right now, I wear my hair as it naturally grows out of my head. But back then, I would go to the, the hair salon and spend hours having my hair relaxed because I knew that that's what was expected of us. And one day, um, one of my, my friends and colleagues there, she decided to just wear her hair naturally. And there was so much flack 
from everyone, mm-hmm. you know, from the, the uh, supervisors who were a diverse group of people, but we were being held to a standard that was unfair for us to meet. And we knew that. So we knew that we couldn't look any way we wanted to look, right? Even though we were following the company dress code and guidelines, we still look professional, but that was something that we were expected to have. And so I thought to myself, you know, I didn't have the words for it back then, but now, you know, decades later, I realized that we were going through a traumatic experience and that that privilege was something that wasn't extended to us and there was no allyship or any of that. But then you said something else that I really, really liked as well. And that's, and, and I believe this too, um, you're using love and, and I tend to use the word empathy. I really think it's important for us to give, allow ourselves some grace, right? And, and be empathetic towards ourselves as well as other people. And so when I, I do think about people in the morning, I try to I tell people all the time, I listen to a conservative radio station in the morning when I wake up. Um, Sometimes I yell at it, (laughs) you know, and other times I think, okay, maybe that point, that makes sense to me, right? From that person's perspective. And and in the evening, I listen to a liberal news station and sometimes I yell at that, you know? And so having said that, you know, I do it as an exercise in empathy because I want to understand where the other person's coming from, even though I don't have to agree with them. Right. And so Mm -hmm. I I think, too, when white men in particular, they're adverse to hearing the word privilege because it has been used to attack them. Right. Or at least what my understanding is, they feel as if they're attacked. Right. And so that's the important Mm -hmm. part, I think, from what you said is that or one of the important parts is the feeling that someone has. Right. So it doesn't mean that they are or they aren't, but we have to acknowledge that feeling. And so I always think if I can push myself to acknowledge someone's feeling and and reach them through empathy, through love. Right. They in turn will hopefully do the same for me, because what it does is open a door for conversation, like authentic conversation. Right. And so Uh one of my colleagues used to well, I have two quick anecdotes that relate to exactly this. Um, one of my colleagues used to use the word privilege. He was like, and he was an older white cisgender male. And he would say, um, you know, I think if we replace the word privilege with benefit of the doubt, it would have a, a whole different impact on people. Oh, yeah. Right? And that kind of struck me. And I was just like, you know, I think it really would because then people's barriers, that fence that we were just talking about would be done away with and people could really see it as, yes, you're given the benefit of the doubt when you're at the supermarket. You're given the benefit of the doubt when you're at the bank. You're given the benefit of the doubt, you know, when you're walking in your neighborhood. And if we, we were able to frame it in that way, maybe it would be um, not an easier way, but maybe it would make the word privilege less, less, um, that's what I'm looking for. It would make it less of a powder keg, perhaps, you know, and and let people just see that we're just trying to have conversation with each other. But then um, and I use this also when I went to I went to diversity and inclusion summit a couple years back that really shaped Mm -hmm. a lot of how I, you know, do my work. And I was really grateful for it. Um, And it was hosted by the Greenville Chamber of Commerce and Nika White was facilitating the the whole day's events. And so there was one speaker there and she was talking about her experiences. And I was sitting next to um, this older white gentleman named Danny. And Danny happened to just be a CEO of his company. And, And, you know, and I happened to be the CEO of mine. And I just, you know, but we got to know each other as Danny and Bertine, and we were talking about some points. And he said, you know, the speaker who was speaking, she was a black woman, and she was talking about her experiences with racism and things of that nature. And then Danny said something. He said, I really want to go and meet her and thank her for what she said. And I was like, well, Danny, why don't you just go up there and do it? Right. And then he was like, oh, I feel like, like, I I don't know. I don't want to be inappropriate. And I was like, well, let's go together. Right. Because and that was a chance for me to to have some allyship with him. But prior to that, our conversation was such where we were talking about the changes happening in South Carolina and being that I'm in Georgia, the changes happening in Georgia, the racial changes that and how diversity was becoming this this, um, you know, this prevalent topic that we needed to address. Right. And so I said to him, 
Uh, Danny, you know what what I happened to see, um, because he was saying how he was afraid that he would offend somebody or say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And I was just like, well, we that falls on all of us. Right. And so I said, I think especially with older white Americans, what I see happening is that their world is changing and to them rapidly. And so even though I'm a part of that world and I've always been a part of that world, we all are because we live in it together. I should be able to live wherever I want and et cetera, et cetera. But I also wanted to put myself in their position um, because now they're expected to just do everything differently rapidly. And yeah. no one's given them the, the tools and empowered them to do that. And then Danny let out this huge like, sigh of relief. And I thought he was going to cry because he was tearing up. And he was like, thank you so much for saying that. And I think that that gave him... Like in, in my in my view, there was we we gave each other a bit of grace, right? Um, yeah, and so you yeah. know that was allyship happening. And I and I mean when I saw this man just like let out this sigh, it's like he'd been holding his breath all this time. And I was just like, well, now we're gonna have to be friends. But <laughs> and so we became friends. But it was yeah. just it. You know, I didn't realize the effect that that had on him. But that was by me holding myself to the standard that I had to be empathetic to understand, to get to the place that we both need to be together. But having said that, yeah. that's where you took me just I, now, Michael. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was thinking like uh, to, to go down that line just a little bit more before we get back on topic is, is um, this idea of a lot of people, especially when we look at intersectionalities, right? And I think that's what a lot of people say when I talk to white people and they're like, well, I grew up poor. And I said, yes. And that's a, that is, that's a privilege you didn't have. You might be white, you might be male, you might be Christian, you might be straight, but you were poor. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's disadvantages there. And a lot of times people see in money, they, we come from this scarcity background. Yes. Oh you know, gosh. and so there's a scarcity of resources. So when they think I'm losing this, they see this loss. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, think about love. Is your love scarce or is it abundant that can encompass everything? Mm -hmm. And that is our resources to make equality and equity and liberation is like love. It's abundant. It can encompass everything we want it to encompass. It's not about losing something if someone gained something. You're not losing anything. When we, when the founders of kind of like marriage equality movement were going for it, they weren't saying straight people, you're going to lose your rights to be married. Exactly. And they weren't saying, give us more money to get married. They were just saying, we just want to marry like you marry. Like, you know what I mean? And so you weren't losing anything, but people come from this idea of, well, we're going to lose family values. Why? No one's telling you what you have to teach in your house or your family or your church or anything like that. You're not losing anything. But we come from this idea of, if I'm giving something away, I've lost it. You know, and I think... Um, that's where I, I, we could go into this colorblind society and everything like that. But, you know, all of that. But I, I think that the scarcity is there. And we'll realize that there's enough to go around. And not saying you have to give up some of yours. I'm not saying anyone has to give up anything. And that's why I love liberation. The tall man is still tall. Right? You know what I mean? So it's about saying without the system, the short man can do just as well, you know, as the tall man. Mm -hmm when we address the systems that put those barriers in place, you know, and that privilege word, I, I love the idea of changing the language around it. And I tell people all the time, yes, we get into this very technical, this born with rights and all that stuff. I said, I just say simply privilege is the ability to navigate the world around you without thinking about one of your identities. Wow. So it is, it is, it is the privilege is you can walk to a grocery store and go through the grocery store and not think about my race. Not think about if there were steps to get in, not think about who my partner is or how my voice is. Is my voice too high? Should I lower it? Should I change it? Not worry about with the clothes I'm wearing. Do I look good enough? You know, not worry about someone following me because of my skin color, whatever that is, or my gender or what time of night I'm going because I'm now a target, right? You know, so I, it, it's all of that. And, you know, of can you navigate your world without thinking about some of your identity? That's privilege. When, but there are people that navigate this world every day or spaces in their world every day that they're very aware. And that's what makes it exhausting. As you were saying, you just get tired, you know, and the fatigue is there. 
that fatigue yeah. is there. But you know what also is there? The hypocrisy is there. And I feel like mm-hmm. part of being a good ally is to call it out. And I'll give another mm-hmm. real example. Um, one time I went into a um, place I always go to, Costco, um, to buy, you know, yeah. that huge vat of ketchup and mustard that everybody needs. <laughs> so I exactly. to go, do some shopping. And I was dressed um, in a Metallica t-shirt because um, some, some of our listeners know I loved heavy metal growing up, still do. But yeah. my jeans and, and like some sneakers, right? And not even any kind of fancy sneakers because I'm not a sneakerhead, but you know, some just basic sneakers. And I went in and somebody was following me and I was so taken aback by that because there was no reason to follow me. And it yeah. was crazy because this was just a couple of years ago. And the, the funny thing was the person following me, because I didn't realize it for a while, but the person following me was a black woman employee at Costco. And I was like, uh-huh. so, you know, privilege extends, as we were saying, to different characteristics and qualities that we each have, right? Um, but I thought to myself, why are you following me? And then I thought, wait, we look exactly the same and clearly you think I am somebody that's going to first, you know, steal what the, you know, 40 pack of toilet paper from Costco and just walk out. Right. But like, I thought to myself, this person whom I look like thinks that I am somebody who would do something, you know, nefarious or, or whatever. Right. And, and I thought, what happened to her? that she thought that I am that person to follow. You know what I mean? Because that was a moment where I was like, all right, I didn't claim empathy in that very moment, but afterwards I'd had that thought. But what was crazy and ironic to me was that same week I went into Costco um, as the CEO of my company um, to talk to them about, and I was speaking with a marketing director about sponsoring a summit that we were having. And I was dressed in a dress and some heels, but the way I was treated was so very different. Right. Mm -hmm. Just from that, you know, and I was just like, well, well, there that is like, what is that? You know, and I had it took me a while to unpack that. But then I realized that um, that sort of thing, I knew it shouldn't happen. But then I for me, the the higher part of my brain was thinking, why did that happen? And why did it happen like that? Why was I treated nicely one way? It was because of how I how I looked. The perception of who I am changed at the same institution right? Based on yeah. what they thought they saw. But having said that, Costco, don't call me to complain, but <laughs> I still shop there. But then yeah. before I take us too much off on a tangent, I wanted to ask you, so you define privilege and, and thank you for doing that um, because I really wanted to know what you thought privilege was, right? And, and what role then do you think that plays in our professional and personal relationships? I think it plays a lot more roles than people I want to admit, right? Uh, when I show up as a white guy, I appear white visually, um, a white guy, um, cisgendered for all intents and purposes, um, I, I think it does affect the people I'm sitting across from. And I, and I think the counselor, when I went through, I'm not a counselor, let me put that out there. I went through a professional counseling program at Georgia State. It's an amazing program. I think they changed it. So GSU, shout, shout out to you all. Um, I did not become a counselor, but I want to work with college students. I want to understand systems and the brain and development and all that. And the counseling program was the way that I wanted to do that and mental health um, issues as well. Um, But what a counseling program teaches you is that um, when you show up and you're sitting across from somebody, they have a narrative in their head. And Brene Brown refers to it as um, a... A crappy first draft, or uh, I think she says the S word, shitty first draft. You know, we all we all put that in our head, right? You know what I mean? Um, and we have to challenge that first draft, you know. But people's first drafts are made on from experiences, right? So you don't know me from any other white guy that's around, right? You know what I mean? So what am I going to say? Or when you hear, even for me, um, when I go in front of training for the first time. Um, I have a high voice. I'm a gay man, right? You know what I mean? To lower that voice. So I make people feel like, um, you know, they can hear me, you know, because I was traumatized how many times in the drive-thru being called ma'am 
And then I'm like, oh, and then it's awkward, like awkward for me. But I'm like, okay, then now do I go up and act like they didn't just call me ma'am? Like, you know what I mean? Um, or, and it's awkward for them because they didn't want to call me ma'am. Like, you know what I mean? Like, no one's intentionally doing that. We're both having that awkward moment, you know, but I naturally lower my voice. Like when I'm in a professional setting, when I answer the phone, I answer it in a lower voice. When I'm recording my voicemail, I try to be a little bit lower in it just so people know. I, and I think our narrative in our own head and the narrative in other people's head, but we have to acknowledge that until we say, this is how I show up and get pa- and, and work through that with a person and build a relationship because the opposite to me of, you know, social justice is love, right? You know what I mean? And so until you build that relationship and have that love, we're going to be finding these fights. Right. You know, we're going to keep on having these conversations and it's not on the people that are targeted that have empathy for the for the targeters. Mm. Right. It's, it's for the allies out there to say, hey, why? Why is the shitty first draft in your head, the crappy first draft in your head this and can you change it? And here's how I've changed it. Mm-hmm. Here's how I'm working on it. I'm not perfect. Right. You know, so for that woman that was following you why is your first draft that this person's going to steal? Absolutely. Like, what is that? But it's not yours to have empathy for that person. And it's not, I tell people all the time, people of color and women and gay people are tired of educating everyone around them. It's time for other people to educate for them and for us to educate ourselves and read books. Waking Up Wide, I have a, a lot of books right here. Waking Up Wide by Debbie Irvin. Um, you know, go to these white privilege conferences that Eddie Moore Jr. and other people are putting on. Like there are books out there that can take you through this journey, but you got to educate yourself, you know, and you got to challenge each other in that space. And that's the creating space that I talk about a lot of using our privilege to create space for um, our colleagues and um, for people. You know. Well, that was just our next question. So how can we use privilege to create that space? and break those barriers. And I love that you said that people have to educate themselves because I remember growing up, um, you know, this was, I was the black friend for a lot of people. And yeah. that is a burden. Why? And, and I used to think, why can't I just be your friend, right? And then I thought, fine, when you're put into that role, then you become this cultural and racial interpreter. And I don't know everyone of my race. Right. I don't know everyone of my particular culture or my background or my ethnic heritage. I know me and the people I know. And that's a relatively small yeah. number of people in the world. Right. And then I realized yeah. I had to I had to empower myself to to know that. Right. And then I had to know, learn the power of no and really say, you know, what you said, like, well, you know what? There are things that you can do about this. And that that taught me the power of allyship as I needed allies at that time, right? Mm-hmm. And I think we all do. It changes from moment to moment, right? But but I really love what you said about people empowering themselves because growing up, my family was not wealthy. I read books, I devoured them and, and they were my passport to the world and to society, yeah. right? So we still have libraries. We still have, you know, you know, for people that do have internet access, we still have the capacity and the ability. It's the wherewithal, I'm wondering, you know, if we have. And I do believe that if people, especially when, when white men in particular, white cisgender men start to have these white privilege, you know, conferences and workshops and <coughs> trainings, I think that is a very powerful thing. And it, it opens the door for us all to go, but particularly other white men, right? And it gives them kind of mm-hmm. kind of this space where they can they can talk about their their authentic feelings and, and that lets them that lets us all be more vulnerable, which I think we need to be right? When we're creating that space for each other. So then, mm-hmm. Michael, I want to ask you this. So what effect do you feel political correctness has on your work and your industry? And before you answer, I want to preface that by saying, I personally believe, and you know this, that political correctness is the opposite of cultural competency. I think as an interpreter, the words that people use in political politically correct language is inaccurate and then opens the door for chaotic, just discussion and relationship but take it away Michael tell me what you think and you don't have to agree with me at all but tell me what you think (laughs) no no, I do I uh, when we you you brought up political correctness I I automatically think it's good and bad right you know it it 
it's it's good because people aren't saying the the crazy stuff that they might say without that. But it gives an illusion of a safe space, and it's an illusion, right? And let's be real about that because it doesn't change your heart and it doesn't change who you are. So almost like there's almost that idea when I I, I got my PhD from Iowa State. I loved Iowa. Um, when I went to Iowa State. Um, Iowa, they had just passed um, the the legal system. The judges just passed um, um, gay marriage, you know, allowing gay people to be married. And so I got there and I'm like, I'm going to this state that's like the fifth in the country, like blah, blah, blah. And this is really cool. And I'm never going to have that in Georgia until the federal government makes it happen in Georgia, you know. And so I was like, okay, well, the first thing that happened when I got there is that um, on the first election, they were, there was campaigns to vote out the judges that passed gay marriage because they were not working to the will of the Iowa people, right? And so there was a big push to vote them out. And so I said to people there, I said, well, at least in Georgia, I knew what I was getting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least in Georgia, I knew it was not going to be passed until it was mandated, right? Whereas here, y'all are are touting that y'all have done this great stuff, but the people voted these judges out. So it's not the will of the people. And so I think political correctness, while it can be good because you can't be in a workplace and use words um, supposedly without having consequences, <laughs> you know, um, with that. But it may, again, it makes the illusion of a safe place. That does not mean someone's on your side. It doesn't mean someone is there for you. Um, so I, I think political correctness hinders everybody. Um, and I, I hear the people on the other side that are saying they're saying like PC, like blah, blah, blah. Why can't everyone just take take something more? Because people are tired of taking it, right? You know what I mean? Like just because you can say it don't mean I need to take it, right? And it's your right to say it. Cool. It's my right to come back and say something back to you or to defend it. And I think we're seeing with our um, – what's beautiful about the Gen Zs of the world is they're tired of taking it. There are activists that are out there. They're saying, no, this is not good enough. And I'm sorry, old people, you can't get on board with us, but we are not going to take it. And not all of us. And I I said this, I I did a Facebook post today about, um, you know, Ahmaud Aubrey and the, the tragic event that happened there. And I did a Facebook there and then our, thing in there, not all of us have to be on the front lines of activism. Um, I had a good friend um, at Iowa State, Dr. La- Laquisha Ankar, that said, you know, I'm not, I'm not made um, to be on, on the front lines, but I'll, I'll bring you food. I'll bring those people food and make food and keep them fed and water, like, and all that stuff. And I, like, we need everybody. Right, you know, on this. So to to to, take, to change the system, everyone, you got to have your activists, you got to have your educators, you got to have your people in the background. I mean, Rosa Parks, everyone's like she took a, a, a seat, but she was the secretary of NAACP before that, right? Mm-hmm. So she was already active, right? She made a stance that day, but she was doing her part well before that day, mm-hmm. right? You know, and I think sometimes we write these. It is the secretary of the NAACP that makes just as much a difference. That's the person that's out there being the mouthpiece, you know, that's keeping things running. Sorry, another tangent. No, no, sorry. I love that you said that. Because <laughs> I, I was thinking the same thing today um, when I was just, and you and I were talking about this off air with um, Ahmad and his, just, just the, the, the slaughter of this young man. And, and it affected me in a way that, you know, really been verbalized completely because I was at my kitchen sink washing dishes this morning and I just thought about it and started to feel like all of these emotions and I I started tearing up and and you know for I am not an overly emotional person but that doesn't mean mm-hmm. it don't affect us right we all present differently and I just had to stop for a minute because I just thought you know this shouldn't be happening here, but I also know the word should has very little power. I, I, it it yeah. mustn't happen, right? It mustn't happen. And I think about, you know, who he was to to everyone. You know, he was a friend. He was a child of someone's. He was, you know, he was just a person who's going out to jog during a pandemic. I mean, don't we have, like, when is America going to honestly let go of this shamefulness that it forces us all to endure, right? When are we going to hold our our citizens to a higher standard? Um, As a parent of a young boy, I myself think about these things for him. How can I explain to him that 
people are meant to be helpers while this is going on, you know? So it affects me on many different levels, but I, I have to say, I love that you said that not everybody, um, well, everybody can, you know, be an activist just in their own way. And I yeah. have, you know, many friends on Facebook who have, you know, they're leaving like these liturgies and and I'm not that person. Um, so yeah. I do things differently. Like I'll give my time and my treasure. I will talk about it with, with individuals, um, you know, but I also don't fault people for putting that out there too, because there's a space for that, right? There's a space for us yeah. all to do what we can. But I think while we're going through this global global pandemic, this this global trauma, we're now adding trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. And and I just I, I was at a loss. I mean, as I said, I'm the child yeah. of immigrants. Um, my parents and I and my whole family, we buy into, we've, we've had the Kool-Aid of, you know, we believe in the American dream. We believe in America. But yeah. this, to me is where we fall short as not only Americans, but as human beings. And we can do so much better. But having said that, this is, we're winding okay. down. Can I share? Yes, share. Yeah, can I share my Facebook status? Yes. Um, so this was my, my thoughts about this this morning with Ahmad. Um, you know, but don't just walk or run, vote. Don't just post on social media, write and call legislators. Don't just be outraged, teach yourself and your friends. Don't just have a heavy heart. Let everyone know how you feel and how it's not okay. White friends, use your voice. Make folks as uncomfortable being racist as you feel speaking up. Silence changes nothing. Sitting in silence makes our black and brown friends have to wonder who's the next Ahmad. Will it be them or their children? And I think that is, that is to me, where it sits. Yeah. My right? people are taking me there because that, and I, I, I could not have said that better because like I said, right now, and it's, it's odd to me as a speaker, as a podcaster, that I don't have words and I realize it's fatigue and it's, it's just, sometimes it just gets to be so much that I, I'm like, you know what, when you said vote, that was the first thing I thought of. I was just like, I'm going to vote this down. I can't say I'll vote it away because I'm one person, but if me and the next person and the next person, then we can all vote it away. But we can't, what we can't do is vote this young man's life back, right? So there has to be justice for him. There has to be a lesson in it for us. And I dare say, this shouldn't be a hard lesson. This shouldn't be a hard lesson. But for some reason, we, for many reasons, we keep going back to this lesson. And I mean, when people are writing thoughts and prayers, I stopped doing that a very, very, very long time ago because what's required is not only thoughts and prayers, of course, but action, action, right? Action. And that's that's what makes us different from, quite, I can't even say that's what makes us different from animals. When animals' lives are threatened, they respond, they use action. And so I would dare say uh, what makes us different is our ability to discern. And we're not using yeah. that, you know, and we need to use that. But then now that we're winding down, I want you to tell yeah. us two things that you'd like to impart upon our listeners. Um, the two things that I think uh, to impart is use whatever privilege you have in your life to create space. And that means um, stop taking up so much brand bandwidth. Those with pr privilege take a lot of bandwidth. Um, and so the way I've challenged myself in that with going through in core and doing more racial and gender justice stuff is stop being the first one to talk, Michael, sit back and listen, um, give people space. Um, cause a lot of people have learned to be quiet, um, because, the uh, people of privilege speak up first and then they move on. Right. So, um, stop talking as much, ask for other opinions, echo with credit, so it's not about taking credit, but say what I heard her team say is this, and that was genius, right? You know, and, and that is, it's really easy for me right now. I'm, I'm the only male on our staff, male identified, um, you know, a uh, person on the, on the staff. So I'm with a lot of women um, of, you know, different races and uh, different backgrounds, you know, and so I always tell myself, I don't need to be the first. Like, you know what I mean? Let, listen to everybody else. They know what they're talking about and sit back and learn. Um, so I, I think that is the first thing. And the second thing I think is educate yourself because if not now, when? Um, and if you 
Um, there are books out there. And if you are listening to this and you're like, Hey, I'm a white person. I'm trying to figure out what books to read. Email me. I'll send you some books on that. Start reading books to our little kids, right? Because they're the generation too. So if not now, when it's time to educate ourselves, the only thing that's going to be different makes us different us now is in five years is the books we read oh. and the experiences we have. Right. So the books we read and the experiences we have is the only thing that's going to change us in the next five years. Mm-hmm. If you sit still, you're going to be the same place. And I think right now we're in a part of society where we can't be in the same place. Yeah. We, like have it, move it, forward. we absolutely have to move forward. Michael, you know that I can talk to you for hours about all of yes. this. And we just touched upon like race and gender. And we were off there, we were talking about, you know, um, society, socioeconomic class, neurodiversity. Um, that is something where I feel like I need another episode on that. But I want to invite you to come back to the show so we can talk Anyhow. more about this because this has been fantastic. And tell all of our listeners where they can find you. Yes. So um, I will give you, well, I work for Guide Inc., which is G U I D E dot org. So um, at Guide Inc., I'm sorry, Guide Inc. G-U-I-D-E-I-N-C dot org. Um, so visit us on the web. I have my um, email there uh, at guide GTI. Um, if you are in kind of uh, youth development and everything like that, please follow us on the social media. We're on Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, Instagram, um, all um, all facets. Um, personally, um, my personal email is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-W Davis, Ph.D., at gmail.com. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would say I have Facebook and I have Instagram, but I don't like, I, I I'm like you. Um, sometimes I, I post very few and far in between things because I don't think I change people's minds or hearts on, on social media. I think it, that's an in-person conversation. While this was heavy on my heart today, if you were to follow me, you weren't going to get a lot of that. Um, with that, I I keep it uh, kind of here's pictures of my life and all that stuff. But uh, email me if I can talk or have explained your book references, and I would love to come back. Because um, I think what you're talking about is just the intersectionality of it all, of People don't look at intersectionality, um, and if we're not planning for the people that are most vulnerable, we are we're leaving people out. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, yeah. well, Michael, I can't thank you enough. I I so enjoy this conversation, and you know, um, I love talking to you. I love being in your space yeah. uh, because I feel like I come away learning so much, but also I'm grateful for you being in the world and doing the work that you do for guide and educating and, and sharing and doing it with an open, a kind and a joyous heart. So I appreciate you on so many levels, but thank you so much for being on the show today. And for everybody listening out there, as always, we want you to continue the conversation um, in these days at your virtual water cooler. And for those of you that are essential workers, we thank you for your service wear your mask, have the water cooler conversation six feet apart, and, you know, tune into the next episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm your host, Bertine Crevacore west and this has been the Global Fluency Podcast. Michael Davis, thank you so much again for being a guest on our show. Thank you for having me. And everyone, remember, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.